With our online learning management system, we want to make sure that you stay safe. So make sure that you consult a doctor, talk to your doctor, make sure that you're physically capable of doing these exercises. And then you want to make sure that you keep any type of safety equipment that you need around you at the time that you need it. You know, back brace, neck brace, any type of wrist or ankle, some type of joint strengthener or something to give you more support. Make sure that you have it around. You can get injured doing this. When you're working with your training partner, go slow. Take your time with them. It's not a race. The only thing that you're racing toward is to try to get more knowledge. So be careful. Consult a doctor. Have equipment laying around. And if you need to, turn it off. Take a rest. Tell your training partner or your training class that you need a rest. Sit to the side. Take some notes. Okay. Welcome to Human Equilibrium 101. What we're going to cover in this course is the basics of human equilibrium. Now, you can spend 20 years trying to knock somebody down, throw them down, whatever it may be, or you can spend a couple of months with us, learn the basics of the science of human equilibrium, the difference between balance and equilibrium, stability versus being unstable, those types of things. And once you start to learn them, then you can begin to apply them in your martial arts. This is a universal operating system type of concept, so we're not having to talk specifically about PROMAC. We'll only talk specifically about PROMAC when we talk about how we actually use the technology of equilibrium. Now this is a very free-flowing thing just like the rest of the courses. So I'm going, you've already read through the notes, you've read through what you're supposed to be reading, you're looking over, you're doing your discussion forums, you're answering your questions, you're doing your homework, working towards those certifications, and then you're going to have these videos which are off-the-cuff lectures covering what we had just talked about. I'll have different students in with me. I encourage you to go ahead and get your students or your friends, your family, your training partner in with you. Follow along what we're doing. Take the theoretical knowledge with your movement and create the application. And remember, this course is not a race. This is just a slow marathon of knowledge to get more and more and more about the science behind martial art and about the science behind yourself. Postural control. A lot of people call it structure breaking. They call it a number of different things. We call it postural control. Why do we call it postural control? The first thing that we develop when we're babies is our eyes. Our eyes look at objects and track objects. Makes sense, right? But we're laying there and we have no neck muscles. Since we have no traps, we have no neck muscles. Our eyes just look and they look and they look. And then one day, from moving like this as a baby and constantly moving around, we start to develop neck muscles. Those neck muscles give us the ability to turn our head and manipulate our head in order to track objects. Most people just don't get into this, but this is how we grow. We track objects. Then one day, we start to get enough strength that we start to crawl. We crawl around, we see objects, we hold our heads up. Babies crawl around like this, looking at things. They don't crawl around like that. They develop the neck muscles. That's what you did as a child. You moved up. Then you started to develop strength in your arms. And you started to reach out and you started to grab things. When we talk about combative striking, the way that I teach striking is completely different than the way other people teach striking. I teach it basically from, a, from child to adulthood way that you're tracking objects and looking at things and so forth. So, that was a tangent. Cut. And I'll come back, I'll do that edit. Okay, make sure you don't forget. So, not so. Man, my mind fucking skipped. Yeah, go after so. No, my mind just completely skipped on where I was. Okay. So once we're crawling, one day we move up and our legs be able to hold us up. They create that internal support structure that we talk about in equilibrium so much. Babies don't have fully developed muscles, they don't have fully developed bones, so they fall down a lot because their body is incapable of supporting that center mass. But as they get older and they get stronger, they develop the ability to keep a stable low bearing area for the baby's little center mass, our center mass, to move around. Our hands start to reach out and they grab things. Postural control is not about breaking structure, it's not about breaking breathing, it's not about that type of stuff. What it basically is about is Posture control is dominating and controlling what we did our entire lives in order to track objects and look at them. And when we do so, we prohibit the body or prohibit the mind and the eyes from tracking objects, and we also manipulate the center mass. So working with our training partner, what we're doing is, is that 
Can you, can you see this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are you under my spell? So I'm moving this back and forth and back and forth. Just follow it with your eyes, okay? Follow it with your eyes. Follow it with your eyes. Follow it with your eyes. Can you follow your eyes up here? A baby can't see it. Follow it with your eyes. Follow it with your eyes. Follow it with your eyes. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. Maybe out of one eye, right? You can't see it out of that other eye. You can't see that. Right. When we start to... There. There. When we control posture, we control eyes. When we control eyes, we control the brain because then it only is able to process what we allow it to process. When we add impacts into it, we panic the brain because the, pan the brain can't see what's happening. Stand in a dark room and have something make noise behind you you don't expect. You will freak out. The reason is, is because your eyes can't see it so your brain starts to draw conclusions. When your brain starts drawing conclusions, you start making mistakes, especially in combat. Postural control is about controlling the ability of the eyes to be able to look around. Once we control that, we control what we can do to it with impacts. Postural control is also controlling the center mass. Remember I said that as babies, we're all wiggly and we move around because we don't have internal support structure. So we can't control our center mass over our low bearing area. So when we control posture, remember, the neck is the first muscles that really develop in order for the eyes to be able to track objects. So when we control this, we start to control the center mass. Turn this way. You can see the center mass is moving back and forth. So controlling it and pushing it over creates a control of his posture. It's not structure breaking, it's moving center mass outside of the load bearing area. Now he's got compensational movements going on. He's dampening. So how do we most effectively control posture? Stand up. Go ahead. I'm gonna put all the force I can on you. Okay? Come right now. Do it. He's a bigger guy than me. I can't do that one. He before it before it even happened, he said he can't do it. A couple of reasons he can't do it. First off, we've got no, not, not up there. What it is, is that we have a point of rotation here. And we have all this weight back behind it, and you are trying to lift this, this point. Yep. When I'm here, you get your body underneath it, and then you use this as a point of rotation, and your head comes up around it. Mm -hmm. Okay? So once you're bent over, bend your knees and come up under it, right? That's the way you move since you were a child. Once you bring your head down here, there's nowhere for your body to go because this, there's no point of rotation. The point of rotation is out here. Mm -hmm. It's basically third class lever that you're trying to pull up here or the point of rotation is out here. So I'd have to go. Exactly. But, but the more I control it, the more it won't happen. Right, Pure postural control ah. is there. <coughs> you see what I can do once I can control the posture. He doesn't see this coming. He doesn't see this coming. He doesn't see that coming. He doesn't see that coming. He doesn't see it. This is why we want to control posture, you okay? Yeah. Once we tie up here and I move down there, I've basically taken everything from him because he can't see what's up here. His body won't want to see what's up here. Then I'll move down there. Once I tie up and I transition to there, yeah, he can see this up here. You can throw knees, but he can't see this up here, which is where we want to attack. He can't see this grab over here in the equilibrium move. He can't see it. That's what postural control is. People talk about breaking structure, which is fine. But breaking structure is completely different. Breaking structure is breaking the internal support structure that builds the ability of the body to stand up against gravity. So I can kick the legs, I can do those different things. Breaking the structure has very little to do with center mass. It's more about breaking the body. I'm controlling center mass. I'm controlling the posture of him. The moment I get him off to the side, everything that he does now is disadvantaged. And the reason is because center mass is outside the load-bearing area. So every time he tries to fight me, 
He moves in such a way that gives me more control every time he comes back over. So when you grab a hold of somebody, pull them off to the side. Now you can see that I don't pull this way. I pull that way. I lift and I pull up here because I'm creating power going down that way. That if I want to pull him, I'm there. I'm bringing that up and over. Control the posture using your entire body. Do not control the posture like this. Why can't I control it? Control the posture moving up into here. And grab the hair, control the posture, getting up here and moving it. Yeah, I've opened this up, but I've opened it up to there and I'm still controlling it. He can't see what's gonna happen. And now, since he can't see what's going to happen, he's blinded. He is now reliant upon the internal support structure and the vestibular system in order to get equilibrium back. Because he can't see it anymore. It's a very complex thing that we talk about. Spine is a very complex thing. Postural control, he can't track what I'm doing. And then it allows me to manipulate his equilibrium because I can move his center mass. But it also takes away his vision. Once his vision starts to go, he's left with an internal support structure and a vestibular system. Now it's a little bit harder for him to stand up. In the beginning of these videos in Human Equilibrium, we talked about a guy with no legs and a guy with vertigo, very different things. A guy with no eyes and a guy with vertigo, very different things. The reason is, is because if you take somebody that's blind, they can still see because they have their vestibular system and their internal support structure. You take somebody that has no legs, you give them their eyes and their vestibular system, and they can still balance and move around and shift their weight back and forth on their center mass. Give them vertigo, take away their vestibular system, and they can't stand up. So what we want to do is, is we want to continually attack that point, and we want to move the body in order that we can get there. Remove elements of those equilibrium components in order to control it. So when you work on postural control, get up there, but don't, come here, don't stay here and think you're going to accomplish work. The body down here is too strong around this point of rotation to accomplish work. You've got to move to different points and make new levers in order to do it. Now I've got a completely different lever and a completely different level of control just by creating a point of rotation with my body versus, come back up, this is where mechanical control comes in, versus this, fight me, yeah, a little bit different there, think about mechanics, think about how you move, think about how you grow, how you see things, how you track objects, how you keep your center mass above your low bearing area, if you think about those things, postural control, and then basic breaking structure become very easy. All right, so when we look at the nature of stability, like the notes covered, it's sometimes better to get a visual representation of what we're talking about. So let's go ahead and look at it. We'll take three different states. Now when you look at these, look at the ball and look at the stability of the ball. That's what we're talking about here. Is we want to imagine this is a tennis ball. You can put it in your backyard. You can actually do this yourself. This is indifferent. Why is it indifferent? Well, we talk about the forces that are acting on the body. At this point, there's no forces acting on the body. There's nothing making it move one way or the other. There's nothing preventing it from moving one way or the other. It's completely indifferent. Right here is unstable. Why is that unstable? Well, there's no forces acting upon it, but you can see at any point it can go back and forth. It can go whichever direction that you want to push it, whichever way you want to force it. And then you have stable. Stable, we're talking about maximum amount of friction. Right here, you have a minimal amount of friction. This is really all you have. Here, you have all of this that can come into play for the friction. But here, you have a maximum amount because it's covering the entire thing. So this has nowhere to go. Its center mass can't travel outside of that area. Here, 
its center mass can go anywhere we want it to go. Here, it's a very minimal area that it can actually move. So this is the nature of what our movement is day to day. When we look at equilibrium, we have stability. Stability is either indifferent, unstable, or stable. So I'm going to call my good training partner in. Scott, come in here. Let me show you what we're talking about. So just face this way, face the camera. And right now, he's in a stable state. He's just relaxed. Let me turn this way a little bit more. Not this way. This way. There you go. All right, put both your feet together, completely together. There we go. At this point, he's got to move. He has to stabilize. Keep your feet together. Or he's going to be in an unstable state of equilibrium. Put your feet shoulder width apart, right there. Here, he's not going to move it anywhere at all. Now put your feet all the way out as far as you possibly can. Here, he's definitely not going to move anywhere. But there's a problem. Just stay right there, right where you are. When we look at this right here, we look at that minimum area with their unstable state. That even though he is very wide right now, forward, he's very unstable. If he's pushed, he has that very little area that he's going to move. He can come back up. So when you look at it, okay, stand up fully, stand on one foot. Put your foot up as high as you can. Now we're in a very unstable state. The reason for that is this right here. He can go anywhere he, anywhere that I want to push him. At this point, he has minimal contact with the ground. He's going to go in that direction. So when you think about you put it down. When you think about movement, you think about working with somebody while they're moving towards you. The more that they get on one foot, the more susceptible they are to being moved in whichever way you want them to be. If they're just standing there completely normal, they're indifferent. You can't really do anything. You have to force them. You have to create a force to make them move. If they've already assumed a wide stance, you've got to do something to create an unstable state in them because they're very stable right now. You either have to push them, pull them. You have to act in such a way in order to do that. So when we talk about the states of equilibrium, unstable, stable, and indifferent, this is a physical representation of what we're talking about. Now let's look at it a little bit more in depth. We're going to look at center mass, and then we're going to look at the angle of stability, and we're going to look at a physical representation of it. So if we have our good friend, Kenny here, that you've seen in the notes that you've been looking at. And this is quick and dirty. The notes have given you a lot more information than what I'm about to give you. I just want to give you some of my little takes on it. So. He's existing in the three-dimensional space. Oh, here. That line goes through, obviously. So you have gravity acting down. You have the internal support structure pushing up, up against it. You have external mechanical force that could actually force him to move in such a way, OK? So these are some of the forces that are moving on the body. And then you have just general force that can act on the body like air. You don't have to push anybody if it's 120 miles per hour outside with the winds. The way that I like to describe center mass, especially when, you, when you're working with one of your students and you, they go, man, I don't know what you're talking about, and it kind of doesn't make sense to me, is even though the notes say that the sum of all the body parts create, you know, gravity assigns weight, which is mass, to each body part, and the sum of all those meets in the center area, which is right in here, right below the navel. The way I like to describe it is, is that your internal support structure is pushing up and gravity is pushing down. The sum of those two coming together meets in a center point. That's the easiest way to describe it to somebody that doesn't know what you're talking about when you start talking about gravity assigning mass to body parts. That creates what is called a line of gravity. So when you look at center mass, you have to look at where it is in the body. If you have no legs, you have no center mass. You do, but it's higher up, and it relies on the nubs down here, if you had nubs, to actually keep your body up. So you do have a center mass, even if you have no legs, because you have an internal support structure. You have that muscular skeletal system. And you still have gravity acting on you to you know, assign your body parts mass. But when you're working with your students, this is the best way to describe it, is center mass, and that's where we're going to be. 
Now, one of the things that you want to remember is, is that center mass is different on everybody, but not as much as you think it would be. The reason that I say that is because some people will tell you center mass up here and some people tell you center mass down there. Anywhere between these two points, if you assign in your mind a, a point on their body as a representation of center mass, either of these two is going to be fine. I've had over time people tell me, you know, Matt, you're completely wrong on center mass because it's actually three inches above the dot what you're talking about. These are the same people that have fake hips and knees and spend 30 years with fake shoulders being thrown around in judo trying to figure out what equilibrium is. So don't pay attention to people like that when they tell you that you're wrong because it's two inches. It's big boy rules and we don't have to put up with that type of stuff. Remember, this area right here, internal support pushing up, gravity pushing down, once we apply an external mechanical force is when we get this moving. The only thing that gets this moving is either it moves itself or something moves it. You have that center mass, that point in the middle. So you can see where we're going, which is a paper cut that I just got on my hand. Um, you can see where we're going with this, which is we have to look at how to apply external mechanical force to get that center mass moving. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and look at fiction and low, or friction and low bearing area. So you have the ground and you have points of contact with the ground that are called feet. Feet, let's draw it out this way. When we look at friction, say this is the ground right here. When your feet are in contact with the ground, you have a maximum amount of friction. But think about somebody that is standing on their tiptoes. Very little friction. Somebody that is only on their heel. Very little friction. Somebody that is actually fully in contact with the ground, that's where you're going to have friction. What that creates is called a load-bearing area. Why is that called a load-bearing area? Because it is bearing the load. It is bearing the internal support structure that's fighting gravity. So those points of friction create that load-bearing area. Once you have friction, you can support the body. When you're up in space, you really don't have a whole lot of friction. If you look at an oily ground, there's not a lot of friction with the ground. So what happens? That center mass starts moving all over the place because there's no friction to support the load-bearing area. The load-bearing area is the area between the feet and the ground where you add your friction. So if I can get Scott to come over here for a second, this is what we're looking at. Turn this way. Right here. The point between this toe, this toe, around the foot, and then his heels is the load-bearing area for him. That bears all the load up. When the center mass starts to move outside of that load-bearing area, you can guess what happens, which is the body becomes unstable. Put both your feet together. That is much less stable than what we were looking at a moment ago because look at how small the load-bearing area is now. It's this big. Okay, so I want you to visually represent, or take a picture of this in your mind. Put your feet out. Complete, now you have all this space. That's why you really have to look at your stance, what you're doing with your, with your feet during your stance. If you have a stance that put your feet together like that, that's not very stable. Take your toe, put it here, and put your heel here, like this. Now you have a very strange one because you have that, you have a big triangle going on. You've got one on his heel, then you've got here, you've got here. So he's not stable at all. One of the keys that you'll find in working with people, you can just put your feet on. One of the keys that you'll find in working with people is that if you look at their stance and you look at your footwork, you, or look at their footwork, you can determine what their equilibrium will be. What state are they going to be in? If somebody takes a horse stance, take a horse stance. There, it looks very stable, but think about how thin this load-bearing area is. So that center mass, if it's right here in the middle, once it moves outside, the body's going to have to adjust. Come back up. There, you have much better because instead of being stretched out along a long way, you have a very small area that it's stretched out and it's more stable. Bring it all the way back in. This is the worst that you can possibly have. The 
reason your horse stance is so bad is because it limits mobility, but it also tends to create a very long, wide, but narrow load-bearing area. So optimally, the way that you're designed is the same way that you would walk. Just stand normal. Like, turn around three times and then just stand however you want. There. That is a natural stance. Most people don't think about that. That is your natural load-bearing area that you will assume when you get out of bed in the morning. When you get out of bed in the morning, you don't like get up on your foot. You don't do this. I know I'm going way off the cue here. <coughs> you don't wake up in the morning. And get out of bed. You don't do that. The reason you don't do that is because your body wants to be stable. You don't get out of bed and assume a horse stance. You don't get out of bed and assume a T stance in fencing. You don't get out of bed and assume some weird ass stance. You assume the stance that supports the load that your body is used to carrying. If it does that, then that's where you want to make your fighting stance. You can work off of it as a basis. Now, we're going to go ahead and we're going to keep moving, but think about your low bearing area. Work with your friends, put them, put, have them do crazy things. Have them stand like this. See how unstable it is. And then think about the idiocy that you see in some martial arts with the footwork that they use. Coefficient of stability is an interesting thing because I see a lot of times people demonstrate it, but they don't know what they're demonstrating. I think, I think it's valuable for you to learn it in terms of equilibrium, in terms of force applied on a body, but I don't think it is dogmatic in that if you don't know it or understand it, you'll fail. It's simply the, the concept of what happens when you apply force to a body. So basically, and the reason that we do these lectures, these short lectures for all of this stuff is that you have things that you can ask questions about and, you know, and say, well, what about this and what about that in these discussion forms and be able to know what we're talking about here. Basically, what we're looking at is, is that the, the coefficient of stability we're looking at when force applied to the body, how much force is required in order to make that body unstable. So you have to look at what the body is going to do in order to create stability. So if the coefficient if, if the force is less than one, then the body is going to remain stable. So what that means is, is that if you're applying force to the body that's less, come over here, Scott, that's less than what the body is pushing back, scoot over just a little bit, okay? So right now, don't, don't resist me at all. That's no resistance at all. So the, my force is more than what he will generally resist. So my force that I'm applying to him is more than what his actual body weight is because if I actually took the sum of all this mass and pushed it up against him, it would just run into a brick wall if he resisted. But if he doesn't resist at all, then whenever I contact him, pushing that area makes the rest of the chain move, which we talk about in um, combative biomechanics in one of the other courses. So when he resists here, I have to push more in order to overcome him. So at that point, I have to be more than one. If I'm just standing here with my hand on and not applying anything that I'm equal to, if he pushes back against me, push back as hard as you can, then I have to create more force to get him out. Now, what happens is, and what we'll look at, you're good, is that as the person applies it back, especially when we look at grasps and grabs in, in some of the other courses, as we look at force resistance and going with resistance, and it comes back to the coefficient of stability. Because what it does is, is it creates, when he pushes back against me here, it creates in his mind, his calculations say, well, I'm not going anywhere because I'm pushing him against him, I'm resisting. When we move with the resistance, then it makes him have to completely change his mindset and make a decision on what to do. What his body will do is now it wants to become stable. So it will do compensate, dampen, or balance, which is what we're going to look at. It's one of those things that you know innately that if I push somebody, I have to push them harder than what their resistance is to make them unstable. But the, way, the reason that we want to teach it is to make sure that you understand that when it comes to resisting force 
and what these numbers are, that you can play with them if you understand the physics, especially in grappling or in pushing matches or whatever. You can play with the physics and set things up and let them come back and work with them in order to get the result that you Keep get. asking. <coughs> so you're pushing me this way, so your force is, say, a third. And I have to apply just as much force back to get to be in a state of equilibrium. Correct. What if <coughs> you're applying force this way, three, and I'm applying force that way, and you take that and use it against me? Would that be a six? Would that be a six? Yeah. If you look at Hooke's law, we're, we're almost at a six when you look at elasticity. That would be just kind of taking it back the other way. Right. And then using it against me. Not really. Okay. Not if you would end up, the moment that, let's say you go, let's so you do it, right? I apply three. You apply three back. Now we're back at zero. Now you're having to apply more force than I'm applying to you. Apply force. Now you're winning. Okay? So now we're going this way. If you're given a three and I'm given a two, mm -hmm. but I pick it up to a four and push it back, we're back to zero. Okay. The only way we can take all of that is to basically change completely the plane that it's working at and take the force that's being applied and, re and then redirect that force into another direction which we'll get to in movement in three planes. Okay. So you're, you're right and you're almost there. The, the primary issue with it is is that you have two bodies acting in opposite directions. It's very difficult to get them to come back to one point and then go all the way. You would almost okay. need a third party to take your energy once it's coming back, yeah. overcome me, and then pull me along okay. in order to get it. That makes sense. Make sense? What, we've, what we've really covered is up to this point is that we've really looked at the body is assigned its weight by gravity. And like we talked about a moment ago, if we go back through these notes, and this is one of the reasons that I love to teach this way, is because I can bring you through everything that's going on and you can see it, especially with you know, a lot of the learning that you're doing right now in the course, is that you're different, unstable, or stable. So this body is sitting there, and this one's waiting for something to happen to it. It could go anywhere. You know, what we don't see on this body is that perhaps that is what it's sitting on the, the cusp of. So if it moves back in this direction, it's fine. But if it goes off the edge, it's completely subject to gravity. So this indifference can move back this way and become stable. It could be back over here to be that, and it can go into stable. Or it could move that way and it could be unstable. So when gravity is working on us and forces are working on us, it's up to what our body and our internal support structure wants to do in order to keep us afloat to keep us up. So when we're looking at this, we're looking at what does the body do in order to stay in a state of equilibrium. Gravity is coming down, it's creating, you know, we're, our internal support structure is putting, pushing up. Gravity is basically assigning every body part a mass, a weight. And then like I talked about is that once you push back up against it, with this coefficient of stability and you push back, you're taking your weight and you're pushing it up against the weight that's pushing towards you. Now the body will do three different things. It will perform three different movements in order to stay in a state of equilibrium. So we're gonna look at each of the three of these types of movements. The first one that we're going to look at is compensational movement. Now compensational movement is very interesting because you've all done it. You just don't realize that you have. So let's draw out the diagram that you have right now in your course. And you already know from looking at the diagram, you have your center mass, you have an arm, you have an arm. Gravity is acting down and external mechanical force comes along and pushes up against it. So we have our load bearing area down here. Once that happens, our little box dude, that center mass 
starts moving outside that load-bearing area. A compensational movement compensates for the force that's being applied towards it. Basically what it does is it compensates by moving kinematic units, moving mass back towards what force is contacting it. So it's going back in that direction. So where what used to be here, what it's trying to do is, is that if it can get this, if it can get this mass out far enough, and you don't have to worry about it, it'll stop. Yep, it goes off. Like I said, folks, a lot of flow in this. So when the force is going this way, right? And let's say that it's a force of two that contacts the body. By throwing mass back this way, if it throws a three back, what happens to that coefficient of stability? Okay, so at first it was one. Then all of a sudden, if that's one and it applies, it's more than one. But once you throw those units back towards it, it's back to even. So the force that went back towards it had to be more. So that's a compensational movement. It compensates for the force being applied to it. So bring Scott in for a second. Let's take a look at it. And I'm going to show you some small intricacies. Now later in the course we will look at actually attacking um, a lot of these movements. What I want you to do is, is I want you just to stand right there and then I'm, I'm going to basically pose you and then you just stand on one foot and bring the other foot out. Okay, like this. Okay? And we'll, so that's all it is, right? So what I want you to look for Keep going. See what he's doing? Compensating. He's compensating for the force that I've applied by throwing body parts back, back towards it. You can see a constant compensation of what's going on. Look at this. It's a beautiful thing because later I'm going to teach him how to attack this consistently. But right now, all we're looking at is how his body will start to throw weight back towards. Right now, the center mass is coming outside that load bearing area. It's right there. So the more we get up, the more he is going to slowly begin to throw things back at it and move all over the place. That's a compensating movement. You can see his leg move, trying to bring everything back. Basically what he's doing is, is the force that I push towards him, the force that gravity is putting on him right now, he is trying to come back consistently and get that coefficient of stability back to where it's more than what's being applied to it. And eventually he loses. The reason he loses, you're good, is because the amount of friction, that load-bearing area, just became, went from this right here to one foot. And then your body is going to start throwing units back towards the force in order, let's look at it, in order to get back that load-bearing area. Right now, let me grab this. Oh, goodness. What we just did to him is a perfect representation of physics of what's happening. That became his load-bearing area that that line of gravity has to travel in. Make sense? <clears throat> so the more he throws back over that way, if he can get what's going back towards it more than what's coming to it, he will get back to stability. But if he can't, it's going to take that center mass, go outside of it. Now we're going to move on. We're going to look at dampening. All right, so let's look at the dampening movement. You've read the notes. You've looked at it. And the notes, you know, one of the things that I always say is this is one of the easiest things that there is because we, we do it all the time. We're used to doing the dampening. So we want to back up a little bit and look at this dampening and go, well, what, the, what the hell is going on with it, okay? Without breaking the expensive tablet. All right. Our guy is sitting here, line of gravity going down. 